So yeah, what we're talking about, what's new in solar for 2020 and beyond. So first, let's talk a little bit about how we got to where we are. So, and uh, oh, wow, can't really see are that. Are you serious? You? So uh, I'll just kind of walk through this a little bit. So 1839 was when the photovoltaic effect was first um, um, observed and the first solar cell was made. That was done by a 19 year old physicist in France. About 20 years later, in 1959, the uh, um, lead acid battery was invented, okay? And so that was important because that was the first battery that you could actually reverse the current and recharge the battery, right? So you had battery and then you had um, uh, solar panels. So 1901, um, Thomas Edison patents the um, iron, uh, nickel iron battery. You might have heard of those as uh, iron Edison batteries. And he thought that there was going to be a electric car revolution. And so he spent a lot of time refining this battery technology because he was sure that if he could get it right and make it light enough, that he would supply all auto manufacturers with batteries. And that's what vehicles would run on. Uh, seven years later, he actually had a breakthrough with the, um, with the battery. That was also the same year the Model T came out and we standardized to gasoline or internal combustion engines in vehicles rather than electric. So his idea kind of fizzled out, but he did invent kind of a neat battery. About 50 years later, Bell Laboratories uh, inverted, invented the first solar module that was commercially viable. Uh, at that point, uh, it cost about $350 per watt. Um, Fast forward to 85, the lithium ion battery in its current format is invented. Um, uh, they invented the technology in 85 or, or discovered it. Uh, and by 91, they were actually making um, lithium ion ba batteries. And that was uh, Sony actually was the company that started that. So jump forward to 2006. In 2006, the solar investment tax credit uh, was put in, which basically said, hey, if you're gonna put solar on your house, we're gonna give you 30% of that money back as a tax credit. Um, at that point, the cost of a solar module, the actual, you know, what, what we hooked up outside uh, was, what is it, 350 a watt? Yeah, 350 a watt at that time. 10 years later, United States hit a million installations and the price was down to 71 cents a watt. And three years after that, we're up to 2 million. This was last year, we hit 2 million installations and we're down to 41 cents a watt. So um, that's the module cost. So that's not the fully landed cost of a system, but you can see, you know, really when that tax credit went in, that really jump-started the solar revolution, you might call it, in the United States, and those economies of scale keep, kept driving costs down, driving costs down. So talking a little about, about uh, breakthroughs in solar technology. So what's happening right now? So you've got a lot of people that are focusing on material science. Um, I used to live pretty close to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and that's actually one of the top material science uh, research facilities in the world. And they're doing a lot of things to try to figure out, okay, can we, can we use a different combination of metals and still get the same effect and maybe have something that's cheaper. You're also seeing a lot of people, because of, the, of all of these panels being manufactured, you've got people focused on the manufacturing process. So everyone know what a saw curve is? Right, saw curve is when you cut something with the saw, it's the width of the blade, and you lose that material, okay? Well, uh, a couple years ago, a company invented a diamond wire saw to cut the wafers that go into solar panels. And so you went from losing, you know, I don't know, a, a very small amount to, lose it, to losing about a tenth of that. So that means that you, you're losing less material in the manufacturing process. So those are the kind of things that are driving the innovation uh, driving the cost of panels down. Um, efficiency is the other thing that you're hearing a lot about, right? So as uh, Mr. Harris would say, efficiency, right? But efficiency is, 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 is definitely a way that we can, we can measure progress, right? So the theoretical, theoretical maximum efficiency of a solar cell is between 30 and 47% based on what materials you use and if you concentrate the, the light as it's coming in. Um, and, you know, for a long time, we were in the 9, 10% range. Uh, up, we're up to 19% now. So that's a 50% increase just over the last few years uh, in, in efficiency. And so what that means is, if you think about this from a, from a 
macro scale, then we can generate the same amount of electric power with 50% less panels, 50% less uh, uh, installations, because each panel is 50% more efficient, right? Um, the other thing that you're hearing a lot about now is limiting losses from a panel by panel in, a, in an array, or even cell to cell within a specific module. So um, if you've got a solar panel and it's got shade on it, whichever cell has the least amount of current going through it, it will limit the entire panel to that amount of current. So let's say you, you, you're losing 50% of um, you know, the, the amount of energy that you're trying to generate from that one cell on a, on a panel that might have 72 cells on it, all 72 cells are now limited to that, yeah. that one. So what they're doing is they're, you've got um, um, technology essentially where they're saying, okay, we're gonna, instead of taking the current and going through all of these cells and coming out the wire, it will go from each cell to the wire. And so what happens at that point is when you get shade on the panel, it's just the part that's actually being shaded that is being limited. So again, that's, it's kind of like an increase in efficiency through manufacturing techniques. So uh, the research and development right now that, that we're seeing is, uh, th there's actually some pretty neat stuff going on. So one of them is a transparent coating that you can put on anything, right? So you could have a park bench, right, in Central Park that has this coating on it. You could have a seat and plug your phone into the bench while you're hanging out, you know, having your lunch, you know, if you were the type of person that wanted to live in New York City. Um, but it can be put on anything, so that means it can be put on the outside of, of windows, right? And so now your windows are generating electricity. Uh, it's not a ton, but it's still something. Thin uh, film printed solar panels. So what that is, is, you know, a lot of people don't like how a solar panel looks. So they're not going to put it on their house, or the HOA is going to prevent them from doing that, that type of thing. But if you could print on top of the solar panel so that it looks exactly like your roof material, then it's, it's almost invisible at that point, right? And so that technology exists right now. They can do that. They can put solar panels on anything and make it look like whatever is behind it. Another one is solar fabrics. So we talked about coating the outside of your window with a film that will actually generate electricity. What if that there was a uh, the curtains that you had on the other side of the window were also generating electricity. Uh, you could put uh, the the triangle uh, canvas awnings, you know, that you see people have in their backyards. Imagine, yeah, imagine if that's uh, generating electricity just like it was a solar panel. So that again, that exists. It's not commercially viable yet, but they're working on it, and you know, they're, I think they're going to get there. There's a market for it. Uh, photovoltaic solar noise barrier. So there's about 3,000 miles of noise barriers alongside interstates in the United States and more to come. And so as you know, more, the more development you have, the closer you get to the interstate, the more people complain about interstate noise. So they put these uh, barriers up. Well, they're doing a lot of research is, okay, how can we implement a photovoltaic, whether it be the thin film covering or actually the part that does the, the baffling can generate electricity for us, right? Put it right on the grid. Um, another interesting thing that people are tinkering around with right now, and I know we've talked about uh, 3D printing a lot recently. I've talked about it on your uh, podcast, talked about it on Jack's podcast. Um, but, you know, you can actually, fo uh, PV ink exists right now. So you can literally take a piece of paper and with the right kind of printer, print, take that piece of pa paper and turn it into a solar panel, right? And so now with that, if you can 3D print the case, 3D print the cover, things like that, you know, now it's like, oh, well, we've got another kid, right? We're gonna have a nursery going. We need to increase uh, the amount of electricity that our house is generating for us. So, you know, we'll just set the 3D printer up and, <laughs> and uh, print a few more solar panels and, and plug them into the array. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. And, and, and a lot of people are working on open source designs that literally, if you got a 3D printer with the capability, the right uh, stuff, you can go get the design and print your uh, solar panel. So um, what this is, is the installed capacity in megawatts. That's what the bar is. And on a separate graph, you've got the actual blended average PV system price, right? So what you see is, is as, you're going, as you've got these years where you're, we're putting more in, we're putting more in, we're putting more in, the price is just absolutely plummeting. And so right now, and actually it's, 
this is 2020 estimated um, in, in a, the uh, recent uh, SIA, um, I think it was a second quarter article, they're actually below this estimated. So they estimated that it was gonna drop X amount, it's actually below that number. So um, when you've got different, different countries, they've got different limitations. So an interesting thing that you see is Japan, you know, they've got a high cost of labor. So they're focusing on how can we automate certain processes, right? How can we take the labor cost out of it? Germany doesn't have a lot of space, right? And a lot of the, the space they do have has forest in it. So they're focusing on efficiency. They wanna bump the efficiency up so every square meter of solar panel is generating more electricity, okay? China and their, you know, the banking system that China has, they're focusing on mass production. If, if something's going wrong with the market, the state is just pumping money into it. The reason why China has the most installed solar on the planet is because that's where they're all being made and no one was buying it. So the state said, well, we will keep making, don't stop, don't slow down. Um, when you saw the really precipitous price drop, I believe it was from 2012 to 2013, that was basically China just flooding the market. It didn't matter that no one was buying them. They were still shooting them out there. And, and so supply and demand economics, you've got the price that goes down. So in the United States, we're actually the, the largest uh, market that's kind of based on capital, like we buy things because we want or need them. And so um, we actually get to take advantage of all of those other countries doing things a little bit differently. It helps everyone, but you know, we're, the US used to be a leader in R&D for solar. We're not anymore. We're not even really trying anymore. And so um, it, it's, it's nice though that we're still seeing the costs go down because other, country are do, other countries are doing the work for us. So um, this is your residential PV pricing. And so what we've got here, the brown is actually the cost of the hardware. So this is your inverters or your charge controllers uh, and your panels, batteries, that type of thing. The uh, blue is soft cost. So that's everything else. It's the labor that it costs to put it in. It's the permitting cost. It is the profit and overhead for the company that's actually doing the work. So as you can see, the percentage, that's what the blue is, is what percentage of the total installed cost are the soft costs? Well, these are the things that get impacted by innovation, right? So if someone invents a drone that can fly a panel up and mount it on the top of your house, you're gonna see that those start coming down. But what it also means is that doing it yourself, or at least doing a portion of the work yourself. ESP, baby. Yeah, so we're at 63% of the cost of a system is not the components, okay? So the more of that that you can do yourself, Get, you know, GSD, get your people together and, and uh, do that, then the more you can continue to drive that price down. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some immediate near-term impacts. Sorry about the size, guys. I'm, I'm not sure why it's, it's uh, so scrunched down, but I'll, I'll describe what we're looking at here. <clears throat> so the line is your utility-scale contracted pipeline. So th this is the uh, amount of installations that have been put out to bid, that the utility has received the bids and signed the contract, right? So typically by the time they get their funding's in place, all those things. And then the blue is the number of installations. So you see uh, in 2016, this is when the US had a banner year. But what, you're, what we're seeing here is, you know, a, a massive record in the, in the amount of, um, um, megawatts that are under contract that have already been signed, right? So this, you know, con contractors are going out, they're buying the materials that they need, they're hiring people, they're training new people to do the work. And the interesting thing is, is that under the most pro-coal president, right, that we've probably had in recent memory, 16 of the last 20 quarters broke a new record for utility scale solar installations under contract. That's not gonna stop. It's not gonna slow down. This isn't being driven by regulations. It's being driven by cost. It doesn't, it's not efficient to run a coal-fired power plant. And I'm not an anti-coal guy. My number one customer is a coal is a coal-fired uh, company, or they're primarily coal. Um, and my number one customer before that was a coal company, and my number one customer for about the past 17 years has been utilities that are primarily generating their electricity from coal. And so I'm talking to these guys, what are you doing? What are you seeing? What are you planning for? And it's, we've got to go to renewables. 
because these coal plants are sometimes some of these plants are 20 years past the life that they were expected to run and I mean a, a coal-fired power plant is essentially a constant controlled explosion they pulverize the coal and then they shoot the coal dust into a big uh, room that, whose walls are made out of water okay so they've got tubes with water in it and they're basically exploding that coal dust constantly over about an 18 month long period to heat the uh, uh, water up into steam to generate the electricity so these things wear out right so when you're talking about units that are 20 years beyond what they're supposed to do the cost that keeps these things up and going is just going through the roof through the roof through the roof you got plants out there right now that are literally losing millions of dollars a year because they're under contract to produce electricity. So the utility has to put the electricity on the grid, but the way that they are doing it costs more than what they're getting for the electricity. So what's driving um, this push at the utility level towards uh, solar and wind to a lesser extent is it, it's the cheapest thing. Once it's installed, you don't have maintenance costs, right? You gotta have someone go out there and squeegee it off, which actually they're doing with drones now. So these big yep. solar fields, you got drones that are going through there and are cleaning these um, these panels up. And you might gain three to 5% efficiency by keeping them clean, right? So that's where the money is going. It's it's the cost and the demand from, uh, you know, users like you are requiring these utilities to diversify their portfolios in terms of generation. I said 16 of the last 20 quarters. The number is actually 14. Sorry about that. So uh, I talked about the investment tax credit. It is expiring in 2024. Or yeah, 2024. So what you're going to see is 2021 through 2023 are all going to be new records every quarter because people are trying to get this money invested before the tax credit runs out. What you might see though is you might see uh, a Biden presidency. It, raise it back up to 30% and extend it, maybe not even put an expiration date on it. And so it's gonna be interesting to see at that point, are, does that actually slow it down, right? Does, does, it, does the uh, impetus to get the money out the door and get these installations in before the tax credit, if the tax credit's not gonna expire, then how does that impact the industry? So that would be an interesting thing uh, to watch. So this is the um, um, US, annual electricity generation by source from 1970 through last year. And so the red is coal. And as you can see, a couple years back, about five years ago, coal actually dropped below natural gas. The first quarter this year had the largest year over year reduction in the amount of electricity that was generated by coal since they started um, tracking it. And that trend is going to continue. The um, Oh, also, uh, we were talking about uh, you know regulatory issues. Under the most pro-coal president that we've had in recent memory, we had more coal coming offline quarter over quarter over quarter for the entire last four years than ever before. And, that, and that's what you're seeing here. Now, and again, the reason is is because they're not building any new ones, right? And because they're too expensive to build, and the ones that are running are just, they're getting beat apart. You'll have, you might have a plant that's got four units generating coal uh, or electricity with coal. And they're probably in the back, they've got another 16 combustion units that are generating it with natural gas. And so what happens is, is when one of these units starts getting really bad, they're actively making uh, decisions like, don't fix it, just we'll use that one for parts to keep the other three going. And then when the second one goes down, it's don't fix it, we, now we've got extra parts to keep the other two. And maybe we can keep these two running, using pulling parts off the other two that are down for a little bit longer than we thought we were going to. But those are the kind of decisions they're making. It's not, well, it's going to cost us $25 million to get this unit back on. They're not doing it. Um, the other thing that you have to look at from a regulatory issue is all of these utilities have... Um, integrated resource plan. So it's kind of like a 10 year plan of what's how are we going to get our electricity? How much do we think the uh, demand is going to go up in certain areas? How are we going to address those demands? And so they've got their 10 year plans in place right now. Um, my guess is that whatever version of the Green New Deal that we end up with, I'm not sure it won't be as 
as wide uh, reaching as as uh, they may have thought, you know, six months ago. But whatever version of that that we end up with, it's going to cause all these utility companies to rewrite their integrated resource plans. Um, and a, a lot of what you're going to see is solar, solar, solar. So how does that help us? Well, again, we saw as the number of installations went up, the cost kept going down, down, down. You're going to start. You're going to see more of that. I mean, we, we went. What did I say? Forty years to go to uh, to one million, right? Three years to go to two million, and we're we're seeing contracted pipelines where you might you might start seeing another million installations per year. Now, one of the things from a regulatory standpoint that doesn't help us is that utilities don't want you generating your own electricity. They want the 15 acre solar field that they put in going onto the grid and then you paying for that electricity. So we just recently saw this in Tennessee where TVA essentially did away with the program. So they went from 21 cents per kilowatt hour down to over time, down to 15, down to 12, down to nine. Uh, then they went to nine and if it was over 10 kilowatts, then you, they took it down to seven cents per kilowatt hour after that. And so they're, you know, constantly trying to drive down their own costs for Tennesseans putting um, solar panels on their roof. And then this year they just did away with the program. And they kind of said, well, you know, we've determined that the program's not financially uh, viable anymore, but we're gonna, we're gonna have something to replace it. Well, what are you gonna have to replace it? Well, we don't know yet. So you're definitely gonna get rid of the program, but you're not gonna replace it, yes? So I work for a electric utility. Okay. Right. So you have to recoup that cost. Yep. And so when you go 100% solar, someone has to pay for that. So right. It's not fair. If you're 100% solar, your next door neighbor who's not ends up paying for that wire. Right. So that's where you have the net metering. Yeah. Or we don't have net metering actually. TVA doesn't allow it. So. Yeah, I'm not but too yeah. sure on that, but the, the impact that will help homeowners will be the battery issue. Mm -hmm. When they change the way the batteries can be used and we can you know buy it as homeowners that's gonna that's gonna shift it absolutely so that happens that's gonna be huge and that's what can we talk at our conferences right are you know what is what is gonna happen right on, on that piece of it but but that's the other part is you know they're trying solar is not alive at night right so right you have to do the, the other yeah I've got I'll, I've got the duck graph you know what the duck graph is so I got the duck graph here in a future slide uh, but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The, the biggest limiting factor is when people want electricity is not typically when the sun is producing or, you know, uh, the solar panels are producing the electricity. So there's definitely an issue with the supply side versus the demand side. And batteries is the solution. So you've got, so Southern Company, which owns Alabama Power and Georgia Power, they've built what they call smart neighborhoods, right? These are pilot programs that they've built in one in Alabama, one in Georgia, obviously. And so what it is, is you've got houses that have solar panels that have battery banks in the house that are all connected in a microgrid and in the center of the neighborhood is a natural gas generator. So everyone in the neighborhood is sharing electricity with each other that they're generating off of their roofs. And when the, when the neighborhood as a whole needs more than it's getting, then they've got the battery. If the smart grid says, hey, we're getting close to our maximum depth of discharge on the battery, crank the generator up. So the generator comes on, tops off everyone's batteries, and then they say, okay, well, we're gonna run off a, we're gonna run off a generator power, we're gonna top everyone's batteries off, and then at 4 a.m., we're gonna stop because we've got tons of usage data, so we know exactly what's gonna happen when these people get up in the morning and turn their uh, TVs on or whatever and get, are getting ready for work. They know exactly because it's all connected into this smart grid, and so they, they may say, okay, at 4 a.m., we're gonna turn it off, we got enough battery power to get us from then until when we kind of start seeing solar. And then again, the solar, it's, it's running the house and it's charging up the batteries. So, you know, cloud goes over, your, your you know, washing machine doesn't turn off. Um, so yeah, so the green, the green new blah, 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 right? What is that gonna look like? So one of the interesting things is this, uh, the, 
I was messing up. Build back better, right? So sort of the three B yeah. program, okay? And so, the, so we know what that looks like, or at least we know what the plan looks like. What becomes legislation is going to be something completely different. But this is the average level of uh, additions to capacity. This red line all the way down here at the bottom. In order to get where the build build back better program wants us to be in 2035. This is the level of new capacity that's got to be installed every single year from 2021 to 2035, okay? And so one of the things that we talk about when we talk about solar is over time, the panels generate less electricity. So not only do you have to install all of this, but you also, because so much of it is going to be solar, well, you've got to install enough additional capacity every year to just take care of your efficiency losses that you're having every year. So when you're talking about, and solar is the uh, the green here, so when you're talking about that much solar, you know, you might need to put in 10 gigawatts a year just to keep up with the batteries being less efficient year over year. Um, so, and this number is 140 gigawatts. So that was, is what would need, 100, yeah, 140 gigawatts has been installed every year from 2021 to 2035 in order to meet the goals of the 3B program. Now, who here lives in a state that has um, the smart IDs? You know what I'm talking about, with the star on them? Oh, yeah, the real, yeah, ID. The, the real ID. Real ID, sorry, yeah, the real ID. Um, so the real ID was uh, an idea that was come up with right after 9-11, right? Uh, and, 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 and the TS, TSA is saying, well, we need to make sure that that's the right person that's getting on the plane, and we want the state to actually do the work to make sure that that's the right person that we're issuing the ID to, okay? So I don't know if you guys have flown any recently, but they've just recently kicked the deadline for that back again. It's now 2021. So we got an idea that was come up with in 2001, right, that's, that's for the security of the country, and 20 years later, we're going to have a deadline, right? And, yeah, security. Um, so 20 years later, we're going to have, is, is the next deadline. So what I'm saying is, is, if we can't get a piece of plastic done in 20 years, Right, as part of a program that was put in place for our security and safety, do you think we're gonna be able to install 140 gigawatts a year? Which is, what, uh, seven times the level that we've been at for the past 50? I don't think so. But they're, they're gonna try, and that's gonna help us if we wanna do local solar. It's gonna help us because the more they do that, the more the costs go down, the more your power bill is gonna go down. So, uh, I've talked to a couple people last night about the math, and again, I'll just kind of zip through this a little bit because I know it's small, you guys in the back probably can't see it, but um, if we, we need to find out, if you're going to put solar on your house, we need to know how many average sun hours per day you have, okay, and we kind of do the math on that to figure out, okay, here's what your bill is, here's what you're paying, here's how much it costs per watt installed to put a solar system in with or without storage. And, and what does that look like from a payback standpoint? So you got your, uh, I asked Matt to yeah. pull his bill up so we can. You want the numbers all the way out to the six decimal places? Nah, nah, let's just use whole numbers. All right, uh, first 800 would be 12 cents. Okay. And then uh, after that, it goes to 13. Okay, we'll just use 12 cents. Okay. So what we're saying is, is, is that, uh, um, he's paying 12 cents per kilowatt hour, right, which is a thousand watt hours, um, to his electric, uh, electrical company. And to the point that you made back there, even if he starts to take a lot of that uh, uh, usage away from solar, he's probably still going to have an access fee or a minimum bill or something like that because you got to pay, look, if, unless you're off the grid, you're going to be using the grid. Even if you've got enough solar panels on your house to take 100% of your annual production, again, you're not using it the same time you're generating it. So in your case, uh, you're in South Carolina, right? So you're probably in the neighborhood of four and a half sun hours per day. So if you take four and a half sun hours per day, so, so the math, here, here's the math. So if we say 
in this example, we're going to say five. Five cent hours a day. I think uh, I think Dallas is like 5.23. Uh, so you know, most of the country is kind of in that range. Um, at an installed cost of a dollar a watt, right? If I put in 10 kW, then it's ten thousand dollars for me to put that system in. If I take my average cent hours a day, multiply it times 365 days times my installed capacity, I get an annual production of 18,250 kilowatt hours, okay? I'm gonna reduce that number by about 20% to take care of efficient, efficiency losses. And what that, what that means is that early, when the panels are newer, I'll probably be above that, but over the life of the thing, I need to do that. You know, wire losses, things like that. that if, so if I do that, that gets me down to 14,600 kilowatt hours. So then you'd multiply that times your net metering rate or, or however your state does it. So some states say your net meter, you, we're gonna do net metering. So you know, you're gonna bank your unused solar production and then we're gonna give it back to you. So essentially it's at whatever cost in your, in your example, it was 12 cents. We're gonna use 10 here just because math is easier. So that gives us $1,460 per year in production. And so similar to what Hawkeye was talking about is he's got two years, right, to pay for all the components because of what he's saving on his electricity bill. Um, so $10,000 in installed cost at $1,460 a year, just a smidge under seven years to break even, um, assuming that the cost of electricity doesn't go up. Now, historically, the cost of electricity has gone up about 3% per year. But as the grid changes, as the, the type of production that's going in changes, um, we, could see, we could see those costs going down for sure. When you're not, when you're not um, um, you know, in Tennessee, we've got this uh, lake on top of a mountain. And so when we have extra electricity during the day, we pump water up to the lake on top of the mountain. And then when we need more electricity in the evening, when people are getting home and turn the ACs up and stuff like that, We've got an 1100 foot pipe that's drilled through the mountain. And so they open the gates up, the water falls through there, turns turbines just like it would at a hydroelectric dam. And that, um, that facility generated something like negative eight million uh, or eight, negative eight billion watts last year. So what we're saying is, is that in order to have the electricity when we need it versus when we're generating it, we had to give up 8 billion watt hours of electricity to do it. So as battery technology gets better, we won't have to do as much of that, right? We don't have to generate an extra 8 billion watts in order to um, level the grid out. So this is what's called the duck curve, okay? And so this is the state of California, and what, and what this is is the demand of electricity over 24 hours. So this is, it starts at midnight and it runs back to midnight. And so what you're seeing here is uh, about seven in the morning, people start having a higher demand for electricity. But that's also when the sun comes out. And because there's so many solar panels in Florida, or Florida, in California, the actual demand drops, falls off a cliff. So the utility companies, this is what they're required to put on the grid. As you can see, it goes down, 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 down till about two o'clock. Then it starts going back up because it's the afternoon. You're not you're getting less direct sunlight on those panels, and then when people um, are getting home, and now the sun is it, it's at least not as intense as it was earlier in the day, it shoots up. So in this scenario, uh, they projected that this year they would need to ramp up 13,000 megawatts in a three-hour period. Okay, yeah. Or is that across this is the whole state. state. Yeah, this is the whole state. And so, I mean, think about it, 13,000 megawatts. So if anyone's ever driven by a big combined cycle plant, which is where you've got like, looks like a couple houses, and then there's like a ramp that goes up, and then there's a stack uh, at the end of it. Uh, a typical combined cycle that they're putting in these days, a big one, is about 1,300 megawatts. So that means you've got to ramp 10 of those up in a three hour period and get them up to full capacity in order to meet this. Well, it, that, you just can't do that, okay? Now I will say, um, the grid that we have in this country is really a modern miracle. I mean, if you think about every time we flip a switch, the light comes on, okay? There's not some you know, battery sitting there that's holding that or capacitor that's holding on to that energy and just 
giving it to us when we want it, that's coming from the grid, right? It might be coming from miles and miles and hundreds of miles away. And, and so you look at, in Texas, you got your own grid, mm -hmm. but outside of Texas, you got half the countries on one grid and the other half of the countries on another grid. So that means an entire half of the United States has all these individual interconnected supply and demand things that, that minute by minute change. And every time you flip that switch, your light comes on, okay? What we're gonna see though, is we're gonna see the only way that you can fix this is by having better batteries, right? And lots of them. And lots of them. So let's talk a little bit about breakthroughs in storage. Really, other than lithium ion, not much. I mean, flooded lead acid batteries really haven't changed in about the past 150 years. So lithium ion, when it came out, I mean, that was, that was a big jump forward. Now, lithium ion batteries can take a de deeper depth of discharge, which means you can take more of the stored energy out of them um, without damaging them than uh, lead acid batteries. They're more efficient. They have a higher charge rate, which means you can top them off faster. They're more energy dense, which means per pound of battery, you have more energy, but they are way more expensive than, than lead acid batteries. So literally this year, and you know, we've had, we've had lithium ion for a while, but this year I did a little thought experiment and looked at a 10 year um, off grid system. Over 10 years, would it make more sense to use lead acid or has lithium caught up enough to where we go with lith lithium ion? And even now in 2020, it's still lead acid. It's not much, it's about $1,000 over a 10 year period, but it's still cheaper to have put batteries in replace them multiple times over that 10 year period versus just the, buying the lithium ions once. Is there anything coming down the pipe or in, is there anything promising? <laughs> thank you for that segue. Yes, thank That's you for the segue. Why. My assistant. Um, so some of the things R&D on the storage side. Uh, so applying nanotechnologies to the current solutions we have specifically lithium ion. Uh, there, there, there's a ton of R&D going on, like I said, <laughs> a lot of it's coming out of uh, Oak Ridge, which is kind of cool when I lived over there. Um, monitoring devices is, is another thing. And so what that does is it, it takes a computer and the computer learns about the battery. It learns about what, how, how the battery needs to react. It learns about the demands on the battery. And then it can actually soften some of those peak loads. Um, material scientists to lessen dependence on cobalt. So cobalt, cobalt is uh, one of the things that is in a lithium ion battery. Cobalt's very expensive and it's hard to get. So they're, I, they're playing around with other material technologies to try to find out, okay, is there some alloy or combination of metals that we can use that's cheaper and easier to use or e easier to get than cobalt? Um, so these are some of the, some of the, the new technologies. So IBM and Mercedes-Benz are partnering together uh, to create a seawater battery. I'm not gonna go into depth about how all of these work. I don't want to put anyone to sleep, but afterwards, if you guys want to talk about it, we can, we can dig into them a little bit. They're, these are all very leading edge, right? So they're not even close to being commercially viable, but they're technologies that work. And if you can get them, you know, if you can get them to be um, commercially viable, then as I said before, it's a game changer. Graphene batteries, so graphene is becoming a lot easier to make and less expensive to make. Uh, micro supercapacitors, which are very expensive, but apparently if you make them with lasers, they lasers. Um, yeah, <laughs> they become uh, they become more a lot more cost effective. Um, this is an interest or interest interesting one: copper foam batteries that you can print at home with a 3D printer. Uh, so the energy density is very low, but they're playing around with it. That's some. I mean, I thought it was pretty neat that they can. Here's your here's your design and your you know, your bag of copper foam, whatever that looks like, just throw it into your 3D printer and, <laughs> and, uh, and print your battery. Um, uh, aluminum air batteries, sodium ion batteries. So sodium is one that I'm, I think might be the one that ends up winning the race here because lithium ion's got a 25 year head start on any of these technologies, but this, you can use the same production methods in the same plants with minimal retooling and make sodium ion batteries instead of lithium ion batteries and sodium is a lot easier to get. Um, so talking about transmission distribution and the future mini grid. And so what, I, what, I, what I'm saying here is 
the dinosaurs were coming at, or the mammals were coming after the dinosaurs, okay? The dinosaurs, for, for the past however long, you've got massive, huge coal-burning plants, right? And, and these, you know, million-mile-long distribution uh, systems and transmission systems, and everything comes from the top down. So it's, even, even in, uh, in Tennessee, where TVA pretty much does all the generation, and we've got like 152 local power companies, but everything comes from TVA, distributed through the power companies. They're responsible for their little piece of the, the distribution, and they're the ones that you get the, the, uh, the bill from every month. Well, that system has worked for us, and it's served us for a long time, and very well. Like I said, I think it, the modern grid is a modern miracle. But as solar becomes less expensive and people can put them on their roofs, if we get this battery thing figured out, those little mini smart neighborhoods, that's going to be the wave of the future. You're going to have very small regional, maybe within a building, um, grids that are responsible for themselves. When they're generating extra, they'll bump it up a level or sideways to a neighbor, okay? And when they need more, then it'll go the opposite way. Now, you'll still have to have nuclear power plants will probably still be around. We'll still have natural gas power plants. So you're still going to have... Uh, a big piece of the load that's going to be driven by non-renewables, but the the top-down method doesn't work when everyone's got, to your point, when everyone's got solar on their rooftops, you've got a lot of electricity being generated when people don't need it, you've got issues with storage, you've got 8 million, you know, watts that you're pumping up, uh, you know, to try to level the, the, the demand with the need. All of those things become so much easier if we're only talking about Jack and his five neighbors, right? And yes, they're going to buy electricity from the grid when they need it, but most of the time they're not going to. Um, so, you know, the, um, so what about the power, right? So we're not, I'm not talking about the electrical power now. I'm talking about the political power. So what you're going to, as I alluded to earlier with regulation, you're still going to have, I mean, look, all of us in this room don't have the power of, of any of the, uh, the big uh, lobby, uh, uh, excuse me, the lobbyists for power generation, for coal, all of that stuff, okay? So there's still going to be, the people that are writing the laws are still going to be the people that are writing the laws for their own benefit, handing it to their congressperson who get, is going to get it passed through. And there's going to be all of these national security reasons and stuff like that. But again, the mammals are coming after the dinosaurs. It's the, the grid that we have now uh, and, and the, the increased demand that we're going to have and, and the ability to generate locally is going to completely change the game. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the Texas model because I think the Texas model might be the intermediate step that we go from co complete top down to mostly bottom up. Um, so what this is, is each one of these colors represents a bid that a specific type of generation puts into uh, the ERCOT system. And so this little small green one at the very bottom, this is the, this is the price, so how tall it is, is how much it costs. So this is your renewable stack. Right after that, you've got nuclear. Right after that, you start getting into natural gas. Then you go, you got, here's one coal plant, right? They were able to get into the stack. Here's another coal plant. So you got some coal plants, some of the newer ones that are still able to generate electricity cheaply enough and then the black line is what uh, the state thinks that they're gonna need that day. So they're saying, okay, here's the stack. Everyone has bid on what the consumer or the distribution company at least is gonna buy the electricity at. We are buy the cheapest first and then we ramp up till we get to, so the very last megawatt that we generate is the most expensive. And as you can see, you get over here, you get into, you know, uh, these, uh, the dark blue would be peaking plants, right? So these are the older style where you basically, you're just, you know, running it like a, a generator, basically. Those are the most expensive. And so they're at the end of the stack. They only come on when they're needed, right? When, when, the, when the load demand gets all the way up here, that's the only time you're going to see those running. And it costs so much because they have to be ready to go. They have to be ready to go every day to respond to the needs of the grid, even if they don't turn on but 10 days a year. So I think, and, and this is interesting too, because Texas is actively not 
they're not throwing a lot of money at it right now, but they're actively inviting their consumers to put rooftop solar in. Okay, um, they, you know they're not doing a, a, a California where they're requiring it for all new construction. There's not these massive, um, you know, they're not playing around with the cost of electricity, so it makes a lot more sense. But Texas have, is actively saying, hey, put some put some solar on your roof. So. Uh, how will the 2020 election impact the industry? Um, if Trump wins, uh, 2021 to 23 are going to be record years, like I said. Um, coal is going to continue to be replaced by natural gas and other fuels. Um, you're going to see some U.S. supply chain opportunities come back. Again, we can't put 140 gigawatts a year in if everything's coming from overseas. And if we are putting 140 gigawatts a year in, there's going to be so much investment here you know, we, we're not really making much, we're not making any cells here, we're not making very many modules here, but if that kind of demand exists, you're going to see a lot more of that manufacturing come back. Um, the price is going to continue to fall, again, economies of scale, uh, and then capital concerns for 2024 and beyond. So the question there is, if the investment tax credit does expire, does it still, is it still a good investment, right? Is it still, are these projects going to continue to be funded at the same rate? If Biden wins, uh, you're going to see investment in the transmission and distribution infrastructure that's going to consolidate utility power and tamp down on the distributed en energy model. Um, the ITC will probably get increased and extended. Um, 2021 and beyond will be record solar installation years. Coal will continue to be replaced by natural gas and other fuels, and the price will continue to fall. So these things aren't changing. This, this is the direction that the ind industry is going in. It's not... It doesn't really matter who's setting the policy. These things are going to happen. The only question is, is okay, well, if the taxes, tax money isn't there, how does that impact the uh, desire for uh, additional funding? So anyone here about the long tailpipe, right? The plug-in cars, it's got a long tailpipe with a coal plant on the end of it. Well, uh, guess what? Solar's cheaper. It's more predictable and more reliable to coal. So long as we are generating with coal every watt, uh, installed of solar is a win. So it's, it's um, you, you don't have uh, a um, solar panel on your roof, blow out a tube, right? And have to come down for four weeks because bad water or bad coal or combination of the two. Um, we have to figure out the storage thing, right? That's, that's gonna be the, the thing that opens up the floodgates. But, you know, over the, the levelized cost of generation over the life of a solar panel is the cheapest way to generate electricity right now. Um, so some resources if you guys want to look into some more of this stuff. Um, Energy Bin is a new one that I just found. I just I threw a screenshot up. Uh, so Energy Bin is an aftermarket um, uh, or it's a it's a it's a marketplace for people that are trying to unload solar modules, whether it be I bought a container load for a project and I've got a pallet left over or someone's got 6,000 uh, panels that have been sitting in a warehouse for three years and haven't been able to sell it, sell it. Maybe they went out of business and liquidated everything. Uh, so Energy Bin is, a, is, a, is an interesting thing. We haven't done any deals on it yet, but yeah, we, we got, Jake and I were uh, uh, talking about load. one, what's that? Tractor trailer, Tractor trailer load. load, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the price that we got quoted yesterday, if you get uh, multiple containers, 21 cents a watt for the for the modules. And again, us the average right now is 41. Um, what was it? One 26. container is 22 cents a watt, and less than a container load is 26 cents a watt. So if I get a pallet for 26 cents a watt, right? And yeah. that's better than we can find at your other backwood solar that we. Have yeah, at. yeah. So energy, and again, you're not. Now the neat thing is, is that at least the ones that we're looking at right now. They are still covered by a manufacturer's warranty. They're not bees, right? They're not, not. They don't have blemishes, and and you know, someone bought them off the back of a truck, right? You get you get the manufacturer's warranty with it. Um, PV watts, which is uh, a great place if you want to run run around with some of those thought experience uh, experiments of okay, well, what would happen if I put a thousand watts on my roof? You can put your address in. You can put in how many watts you're going to install. You can adjust the efficiency down rating and it'll tell you literally every hour of the year how much electricity you're going to generate based on the um, um, solar data that they have for that location. NREL, this is the National Renewable, uh, geez, 
can't remember now. Uh, but in any case, it's it's the essentially the government entity that is that is still working on R and D, trying to understand where do we need to put the money to get the most bang for our buck. Uh, there's tons of great information there. All of those solar maps are on NREL. Um, Backwood Solar, I bought tons of stuff from those guys over the year. They're super helpful, particularly if you're going to go off grid. They've got everything that you're going to need. Alt eStore, Sunelec, uh, those are both um, low price providers. But again, this energy bin has been, uh, I mean, they're so far below anything that we've seen on any of those sites that it's not even fun. Yeah, Sunelec, I think we got 33 cents was the best we've seen recently. Yeah. That, that's I, just for the, the actual panel, the uh, photo panel, right? That doesn't yeah. seem like a, a housing or whatever to put it up on your roof. You yeah, no, so, that, I mean, if someone has a mounting system and they've got extra parts, you probably get to find it on Energy Bin. Any of these others will have those those uh, those systems. You can you can buy pretty much a turnkey system from any of those. Uh, and then SIA, which is basically the trade organization for solar installers. They've got a ton of great information. Uh, they do a lot of work kind of forecasting, looking ahead, what, what are things going to look like a year, five, ten years from now. Uh, and so there's a ton of great information there. With that being said, who's got questions? Yes? Since you uh, have to marry the, the uh, gas generation with the solar to balance it all out, what do you think about companies like Bloom Energy that basically take natural gas or hydrogen or, or methane or whatever and convert it without combustion to electricity as a source compared to uh, I think that if it was commercially viable based on what the public is willing to pay for, there'd be a lot more of it. But it's it, you, like it's that it's that peak, right? That's the problem. The reality is, is that all these peaking plants that we built, you know, in the early 2000s, most of them aren't being used very much, but they're still there. They're still available to run. Um, and so I don't think you're going to see a ton of um, innovation on that side of the business. I still think there's a possibility that we get some more nuclear plants going. You know, the, I don't know if anyone lives in Georgia or has followed what's happened at Plant Vogel down in Georgia, but I mean, it's it is a cluster bomb. We'll say they they so when they started building that, I believe the price the estimated price tag was nine to twelve billion dollars. Uh, they're probably going to be in the twenty eight billion range and multiple years late by the time they get up. So, and some are what they're using. It was the same company actually with the same idea. They were going to modulize the plant, right? So they're going to build most of the components off site and then um, put them together on site. Well, the problem is, is that nuclear requires very, very specific tolerances. Like you can't be out more than X, right? And so you're getting all this stuff delivered to the site and nothing was within tolerances. Uh, so I think, wasn't it Westinghouse, Westinghouse that went out of business? Bankrupt, yeah. yeah, owned by Toshiba, I think. Um, yeah. And so, uh, and you know, there's been quite a few uh, EPC, which is the companies that actually like manage the construction, quite a few of those on there. So other company took it over for a while, then they brought someone else in. But yeah, you know, realistically, you're probably gonna, have, this plant's probably gonna be $30 billion by the time it's done. And I don't know if you guys heard the expert panel uh, question that I answered, but that investment, could put in if you had the space and you had the you had the, the storage issue worked out that amount of money could put in enough solar in Georgia to take care of the entire state's annual need. So one nuclear plant, right? Um, what they're going to end up spending on it. So I, I, I still think that nuclear is a good technology. We just don't do enough of it to be good at it. That's the problem. Yeah. You didn't comment on uh, like uh, Tesla's uh, solar shingles. And, uh, or the, the, the Powerwall, is that, are they still in the game? I think Powerwall is a fantastic um, technology, uh, but it's better. I mean, that's all it is. Yeah. Uh, I think the solar shingles are kind of, I, I think that was a marketing stunt. <laughs> I don't know of any houses with solar roofs on them. That's right. Yeah. So natural gas is essentially a waste product from fracking operations, right? It's like people are basically just saying, can you please take this? Cause my flaring permit ran out so I can't burn it off while I get the oil out of here. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. If that, if that, uh, that would be a game changer because you're going to see the price of natural gas go up. And what I think you'll probably end up seeing is a lot more people pouring money into figuring out how to store electricity so that we can use, you know, there's no peak sun. 
right? And uh, there's also more solar, more solar power lands on the earth in one hour. More solar power lands on the earth in one hour than the entire population of the planet uses in a year. Okay, um, so th it's not the resource isn't there; it's that we got to figure out how to use it uh, in a smart way. Yes. What do you think about the off-lease panels that you can get? You know, they're usually about seventy-five to fifty percent cheaper than. The uh, yeah. So basically, we're like you're you're just paying a company. They're 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 they own the generation. You're paying them for it essentially well, to put it on your roof. The ones that have been used, like the used panels. Oh. You can use them for grid tie, yeah. As long as they're UL listed, absolutely. Yeah. I did an installation last year on my house with used panels that's grid tie. As long as they're UL listed. Yeah. Now, again, this is so in order to get in order to do a grid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no yeah, absolutely. Um, in order to do a in order to do a grid tied system, you essentially have to. You know, the state's got to sign off on it. Your local power company's got to sign off on it. And whoever owns the grid has to sign off on it. So in Tennessee, it was TVA. So you have to, you, and they, they all have their own individual requirements that you've got to go through. Um, but yeah, from a from a technology standpoint, yeah, if you could get used panels for, you know, 50 cents on the dollar, you know, I'd test them before you put them into a system, but yeah. Oh, there it goes. Thank you, they would certify. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Oh, we're out of time. One more question. All right. Not one more. Oh. Just a comment. I um, went to a handful of those websites that you pointed out, and this may not be applicable to anybody else. But it's, well, okay. So for a home system, it makes sense, but um, those prices, they they're going to charge you freight. So for me, like I got three panels. Yeah. It would have cost more in shipping than to just buy them off of Amazon. Right. So right. I yeah. ended up paying a dollar a watt yeah. for mine. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. All right. Good.